Little House in the Big Woods by Laura Ingalls Wilder. The story takes place in 1871 and is about a young girl by the name of Laura Ingalls and her family who live in a house in the woods and about the challenges and the joys of pioneer life. And so, as always, my friend, settling comfortably under the covers, Take a full, comfortable breath. And as you exhale, relax and let go. Allow any tension to just melt away. Letting your body sink deeper and deeper down into the softness of your bed. There is nothing else to do and nowhere else to be. So just lay back, relax, and enjoy the story. Chapter 9 Going to Town after the sugar snow had gone, spring came. Birds sang in the leafing hazel bushes along the crooked rail fence. The grass grew green again, and the woods were full of wildflowers. Buttercups and violets, thimble flowers, and tiny starry grass flowers were everywhere. As soon as the days were warm, Laura and Mary begged to be allowed to run barefoot. At first they might only run around the woodpile and back in their bare feet. Next day they could run farther, and soon their shoes were oiled and put away, and they ran barefoot all day long. Every night they had to wash their feet before they went to bed. Under the hems of their skirts, their ankles and their feet were as brown as their faces. They had playhouses under the two big oak trees in front of the house. Mary's playhouse was under Mary's tree, and Laura's playhouse was under Laura's tree. The soft grass made a green carpet for them. The green leaves were the roofs, and through them they could see bits of the blue sky. Pa made a swing of tough bark and hung it to a large low branch of Laura's tree. It was her swing because it was her tree, but she had to be unselfish and let Mary swing in it whenever she wanted to. Mary had a cracked saucer to play with, and Laura had a beautiful cup with only one big piece broken out of it. Charlotte and Nettie and the two little wooden men Pa had made lived in the playhouse with them. Every day, they made fresh leaf hats for Charlotte and Nettie, and they made little leaf cups and saucers to set on their table. The table was a nice, smooth rock. Suki and Rosie, the cows, were turned loose in the woods now to eat the wild grass and the juicy new leaves. There were two little calves in the barnyard and seven little pigs with the mother hog in the pig pen. In the clearing he had made last year, Pa was plowing around the stumps and putting in his crops. One night he came in from work and said to Laura, What do you think I saw today? She couldn't guess. Well, Pa said, when I was working in the clearing this morning, I looked up, and there at the edge of the woods stood a deer. She was a doe, a mother deer, and you'll never guess what was with her. A baby deer, Laura and Mary guessed together, clasping their hands. Yes, Pa said. Her fawn was with her. It was a pretty little thing, the softest fawn color with big dark eyes. It had the tiniest feet, not much bigger than my thumb, 
and it had slender little legs and the softest muzzle. It stood there and looked at me with its large, soft eyes, wondering what I was. I was not afraid at all. You wouldn't shoot a little baby deer, would you, Pa? Laura said. No, never, he answered. Nor its ma, nor its pa. No more hunting now, till all the wild animals have grown up. We'll just have to do without fresh meat till fall. Pa said that as soon as he had the crops in, they would all go to town. Laura and Mary could go too. They were old enough now. They were very much excited, and next day they tried to play going to town. They could not do it very well, because they were not quite sure what a town was like. They knew there was a store in town, but they had never seen a store. Nearly every day after that, Charlotte and Nettie would ask if they could go to town, but Laura and Mary always said, No, dear, you can't go this year. Perhaps next year you are good. Then you can go. Then one night Pa said, We'll go to town tomorrow. That night, though it was the middle of the week, Ma bathed Laura and Mary all over, and she put up their hair. She divided their long hair into wisps, combed each wisp with a wet comb, and wound it tightly on a bit of rag. There were knobby little bumps all over their heads, whichever way they turned on their pillows. In the morning, their hair would be curly. They were so excited that they did not go to sleep at once. Ma was not sitting with her mending basket as usual. She was busy getting everything ready for a quick breakfast and laying out the best stockings and petticoats and dresses and Pa's good shirt and her own dark brown calico with the little purple flowers on it. The days were longer now. In the morning, Ma blew out the lamp before they finished breakfast. It was a beautiful, clear spring morning. Ma hurried Laura and Mary with their breakfast, and she washed the dishes quickly. They put on their stockings and shoes while she made the beds. Then she helped them put on their best dresses, Mary's china blue calico and Laura's dark red calico. Mary buttoned Laura up the back, and then Ma buttoned Mary. Ma took the rags off their hair and combed it into long, round curls that hung down over their shoulders. She combed so fast that the snarls hurt dreadfully. Mary's hair was beautifully golden, but Laura's was only a dirt color brown. When their curls were done, Ma tied their sunbonnets under their chins. She fastened her collar with the gold pin, and she was putting on her hat when Pa drove up to the gate. He had curried the horses till they shone. He had swept the wagon box clean and laid a clean blanket on the wagon seat. Ma, with baby Carrie in her arms, sat up on the wagon seat with Pa. Aunt Laura and Mary sat on a board fastened across the wagon box behind the seat. They were happy as they drove through the springtime woods. Carrie laughed and bounced. Ma was smiling, and Pa whistled while he drove the horses. The sun was bright and warm on the road. Sweet, cool smells came out of the leafy woods. Rabbits stood up in the road ahead, their little front paws dangling down and their noses sniffing, and the sun shone through their tall, twitching ears. Then they bounded away with a flash of little white tail. Twice, Laura and Mary saw deer looking at them with large, dark eyes from the shadows among the trees. It was seven miles to town, the town was named Pepin, and it was on the shore of Lake Pepin. After a long time, Laura began to see glimpses of blue water between the trees. 
The hard road turned to soft sand. The wagon wheels went deep down in it, and the horses pulled and sweated. Often, Pa stopped them to rest for a few minutes. Then all at once, the road came out of the woods, and Laura saw the lake. It was as blue as the sky, and it went to the edge of the world. As far as she could see, there was nothing but flat blue water. Very far away, the sky and the water met, and there was a darker blue line. The sky was large overhead. Laura had never known that the sky was so big. There was so much empty space all around her that she felt small and frightened and glad that Pa and Ma were there. Suddenly, the sunshine was hot. The sun was almost overhead in the large, empty sky, and the cool woods stood back from the edge of the lake. Even the big woods seemed smaller under so much sky. Pa stopped the horses and turned around on the wagon seat. He pointed ahead with his whip. There you are, Laura and Mary, he said. There's the town of Pepin. Laura stood up on the board, and Pa held her safe by the arm so she could see the town. When she saw it, she could hardly breathe. She knew how Yankee Doodle felt when he could not see the town because there were so many houses. Right on the edge of the lake, there was one great big building. That was the store, Pa told her. It was not made of logs. It was made of wide gray boards running up and down. The sand spread all around it. Behind the store, there was a clearing, larger than Pa's clearing in the woods at home. Standing among the stumps, there were more houses than Laura could count. They were not made of logs either. They were made of boards, like the store. Laura had never imagined so many houses, and they were so close together. Of course, they were much smaller than the store. One of them was made of new boards that had not had time to get gray. It was the yellow color of newly cut wood. People were living in these houses. Smoke rose up from their chimneys. Though it was not Monday, some woman had spread out a washing on the bushes and stumps by her house. Several girls and boys were playing in the sunshine in the open space between the store and the houses. They were jumping from one stump to the next stump and shouting. Well, that's Pepin, Pa said. Laura just nodded her head. She looked and looked and could not say a word. After a while, she sat down again, and the horses went on. They left the wagon on the shore of the lake. Pa unhitched the horses and tied one to each side of the wagon box. Then he took Laura and Mary by the hand, and Ma came beside them carrying baby Carrie. They walked through the deep sand to the store. The warm sand came in over the tops of Laura's shoes. There was a wide platform in front of the store, and at one end of it, steps went up to it out of the sand. Laura's heart was beating so fast that she could hardly climb the steps. She was trembling all over. This was the store to which Pa came to trade his furs. When they went in, the storekeeper knew him. The storekeeper came out from behind the counter and spoke to him and to Ma, and then Laura and Mary had to show their manners. Mary said, How do you do? But Laura could not say anything. The storekeeper said to Pa and Ma, That's a pretty little girl you've got there and he admired Mary's golden curls. But he did not say anything about Laura or about her curls. They were ugly and brown. 
The store was full of things to look at. All along one side of it were shelves full of colored prints and calicoes. There were beautiful pinks and blues and reds and browns and purples. On the floor along the sides of the plank counters, there were kegs of nails and kegs of round gray shot, and there were big wooden pails full of candy. There were sacks of salt and sacks of store sugar. In the middle of the store was a plow made of shiny wood with a glittering bright plowshare, and there were steel axe heads and hammer heads and saws and all kinds of knives, hunting knives and skinning knives and butcher knives and jack knives. There were big boots and little boots, big shoes and little shoes. Laura could have looked for weeks and not seen all the things that were in that store. She had not known there were so many things in the world. Pa and Ma traded for a long time. The storekeeper took down bolts and bolts of beautiful calicoes and spread them out for Ma to finger and look at and price. Laura and Mary looked, but must not touch. Every new color and pattern was prettier than the last, and there were so many of them, Laura did not know how Ma could ever choose. Ma chose two patterns of calico to make shirts for Pa, and a piece of brown denim to make him a jumper. Then she got some white cloth to make sheets and underwear. Pa got enough calico to make Ma a new apron. Ma said, Oh, no, Charles, I don't really need it. But Pa laughed and said she must pick it out, or he would get her the turkey red piece with the big yellow pattern. Ma smiled and flushed pink, and she picked out a pattern of rosebuds and leaves on a soft, fawn-colored ground. Then Pa got for himself some tobacco to smoke in his pipe, and Ma got a pound of tea and a little paper package of store sugar to have in the house when company came. It was a pale brown sugar, not dark brown like the maple sugar Ma used for every day. When all the trading was done, the storekeeper gave Mary and Laura each a piece of candy. They were so astonished and so pleased that they just stood looking at their candies. Then Mary remembered and said, Thank you. Laura could not speak. Everybody was waiting, and she could not make a sound. Ma had to ask her, What do you say, Laura? Then Laura opened her mouth and gulped and whispered, Thank you. After that, they went out of the store. Both pieces of candy were white and flat and thin and heart-shaped. There was printing on them in red letters. Ma read it for them. Mary's said, Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Laura's said only, Sweets to the sweet. The pieces of candy were exactly the same size. Laura's printing was larger than Mary's. They all went back through the sand to the wagon on the lake shore. Pa fed the horses on the bottom of the wagon box some oats he had brought for their dinner. Ma opened the picnic box. They all sat on the warm sand near the wagon and ate bread and butter and cheese, hard-boiled eggs and cookies. The waves of Lake Pepin curled up on the shore at their feet and slid back with the smallest hissing sound. After dinner, Pa went back to the store to talk a while with other men. Ma sat holding Carrie quietly until she went to sleep. But Laura and Mary ran along the lake shore, picking up pretty pebbles that had been rolled back and forth by the waves until they were polished smooth. There were no pebbles like that in the big woods. When she found a pretty one, Laura put it in her pocket. 
and there were so many, each prettier than the last, that she filled her pocket full. Then Pa called, and they ran back to the wagon, for the horses were hitched up, and it was time to go home. Laura was so happy when she ran through the sand to Pa, with all those beautiful pebbles in her pocket. But when Pa picked her up and tossed her into the wagon, a dreadful thing happened. The heavy pebbles tore her pocket right out of her dress. The pocket fell, and the pebbles rolled all over the bottom of the wagon box. Laura cried because she had torn her best dress. Ma gave Carrie to Pa and came quickly to look at the torn place. Then she said it was all right. Stop crying, Laura, she said. I can fix it. She showed Laura that the dress was not torn at all, nor the pocket. The pocket was a little bag, sewed into the seam of the dress skirt and hanging under it. Only the seams had ripped. Ma could sew the pocket in again as good as new. Pick up the pretty pebbles, Laura, Ma said, and another time don't be so greedy. So Laura gathered up the pebbles, put them in the pocket, and carried the pocket in her lap. She did not mind very much when Pa laughed at her for being such a greedy little girl that she took more than she could carry away. Nothing like that ever happened to Mary. Mary was a good little girl who always kept her dress clean and neat and minded her manners. Mary had lovely golden curls, and her candy heart had a poem on it. Mary looked very good and sweet, unrumpled and clean, sitting on the board beside Laura. Laura did not think it was fair. But it had been a wonderful day, the most wonderful day in her whole life. She thought about that beautiful lake and the town she had seen and the big store full of so many things. She held the pebbles carefully in her lap and her candy heart wrapped carefully in her handkerchief until she got home and could put it away to keep always. It was too pretty to eat. The wagon jolted along the homeward road through the big woods. The sun set, and the woods grew darker. But before the last of the twilight was gone, the moon rose, and they were safe, because Pa had his gun. The soft moonlight came down through the treetops and made patches of light and shade on the road ahead. The horse's hoofs made a cheerful clippity-clop. Laura and Mary did not say anything, because they were very tired, and Ma sat silently, holding baby Carrie, sleeping in her arms. But Pa sang softly. Mid pleasures and palaces, though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Chapter 10 Summertime Now it was summertime, and people went visiting. Sometimes Uncle Henry or Uncle George or Grandpa came riding out of the big woods to see Pa. Ma would come to the door and ask how all the folks were, and she would say, Charles is in the clearing. Then she would cook more dinner than usual, and dinner time would be longer. Pa and Ma and the visitor would sit talking a little while before they went back to work. Sometimes, Ma let Laura and Mary go across the road and down the hill to see Mrs. Peterson. The Petersons had just moved in. Their house was new and always very neat because Mrs. Peterson had no little girls to muss it up. She was a Swede, and she let Laura and Mary look at all the pretty things she had brought from Sweden. Laces and colored embroideries and china. Mrs. Peterson talked Swedish to them, and they talked English to her, and they understood each other perfectly. 
She always gave them each a cookie when they left, and they nibbled the cookies very slowly while they walked home. Laura nibbled away exactly half of hers, and Mary nibbled exactly half of hers, and the other halves they saved for baby Carrie. Then when they got home, Carrie had two half cookies, and that was a whole cookie. This wasn't right. All they wanted to do was divide the cookies fairly with Carrie. Still, if Mary saved half her cookie while Laura ate the whole of hers, or if Laura saved half and Mary ate her whole cookie, that wouldn't be fair either. They didn't know what to do, so each saved half and gave it to baby Carrie, but they always felt that somehow that wasn't quite fair. Sometimes, a neighbor sent word that the family was coming to spend the day. Then Ma did extra cleaning and cooking and opened the package of store sugar. And on the day set, a wagon would come driving up to the gate in the morning and there would be strange children to play with. When Mr. and Mrs. Juliet came, they brought Eva and Clarence with them. Eva was a pretty girl with dark eyes and black curls. She played carefully and kept her dress clean and smooth. Mary liked that, but Laura liked better to play with Clarence. Clarence was red-headed and freckled and always laughing. His clothes were pretty, too. He wore a blue suit, buttoned all the way up the front with bright gilt buttons and trimmed with braid, and he had copper-toed shoes. The strips of copper across the toes were so glittering bright that Laura wished she were a boy. Little girls didn't wear copper toes. Laura and Clarence ran and shouted and climbed trees, while Mary and Eva walked nicely together and talked. Ma and Mrs. Juliet visited and looked at a book which Mrs. Juliet had brought, and Pa and Mr. Juliet looked at the horses and the crops and smoked their pipes. Once, Aunt Lottie came to spend the day. That morning, Laura had to stand still a long time while Ma unwound her hair from the cloth strings and combed it into long curls. Mary was all ready, sitting primly on a chair, with her golden curls shining and her china blue dress fresh and crisp. Laura liked her own red dress, but Ma pulled her hair dreadfully and it was brown instead of golden, so that no one noticed it. Everyone noticed and admired Mary's. There, Ma said at last, your hair is curled beautifully, and Lottie is coming. Run meet her, both of you, and ask her which she likes best, brown curls or golden curls. Laura and Mary ran out of the door and down the path, for Aunt Lottie was already at the gate, Aunt Lottie was a big girl, much taller than Mary. Her dress was a beautiful pink, and she was swinging a pink sunbonnet by one string. Which do you like best, Aunt Lottie? Mary asked. Brown curls or golden curls? Ma had told them to ask that, and Mary was a very good little girl who always did exactly as she was told. Laura waited to hear what Aunt Lottie would say and she felt miserable. I like both kinds best, Aunt Lottie said, smiling. She took Laura and Mary by the hand, one on either side, and they danced along to the door where Ma stood. The sunshine came streaming through the windows into the house, and everything was so neat and pretty. The table was covered with a red cloth, and the cook stove was polished shining black. Through the bedroom door, Laura could see the trundle bed in its place under the big bed. The pantry door stood wide open, giving the sight and smell of goodies on the shelves, and Black Susan came purring down the stairs from the attic, where she had been taking a nap. It was all so pleasant, and Laura felt so happy and good that no one would ever have thought she could be as naughty as she was that evening. Aunt Lottie had gone, and Laura and Mary were tired and cross. 
They were at the woodpile, gathering a pan of chips to kindle the fire in the morning. They always hated to pick up chips, but every day they had to do it. Tonight, they hated it more than ever. Laura grabbed the biggest chip, and Mary said, I don't care. Aunt Lottie likes my hair best anyway. Golden hair is lots prettier than brown. Laura's throat swelled tight, and she could not speak. She knew golden hair was prettier than brown. She couldn't speak, so she reached out quickly and slapped Mary's face. Then she heard Pa say, Come here, Laura. She went slowly, dragging her feet. Pa was sitting just inside the door. He had seen her slap Mary. You remember, Pa said. I told you girls you must never strike each other. Laura began. But Mary said, That makes no difference, said Pa. It is what I say that you must mind. Laura sat on a chair in the corner and sobbed. When she stopped sobbing, she sulked. The only thing in the whole world to be glad about was that Mary had to fill the chip pan all by herself. At last, when it was getting dark, Pa said again, Come here, Laura. His voice was kind, and when Laura came, he took her on his knee and hugged her close. She sat in the crook of his arm, her head against his shoulder, and his long brown whiskers partly covering her eyes, and everything was all right again. She told Pa all about it, and she asked him, You don't like golden hair better than brown, do you? Pa's blue eyes shone down at her, and he said, Well, Laura, my hair is brown. She had not thought of that. Pa's hair was brown, and his whiskers were brown, and she thought brown was a lovely color. But she was still glad that Mary had to gather all the chips. In the summer evenings, Pa did not tell stories or play the fiddle. Summer days were long, and he was tired after he had worked all day in the fields. Ma was busy, too. Laura and Mary helped her weed the garden, and they helped her feed the calves and the hens. They gathered the eggs, and they helped make cheese. When the grass was tall and thick in the woods, and the cows were getting plenty of milk, that was the time to make cheese. Somebody must kill a calf, for cheese cannot be made without rennet, and rennet is the lining of a young calf's stomach. The calf must be very young, so that it had never eaten anything but milk. Laura was afraid that Pa must kill one of the little calves in the barn. They were so sweet. One was fawn-colored, and one was red, and their hair was so soft, and their large eyes so wondering. Laura's heart beat fast when Ma talked to Pa about making cheese. Pa would not kill either of his calves because they were heifers and would grow into cows. He went to Grandpa's and to Uncle Henry's to talk about the cheese making, and Uncle Henry said he would kill one of his calves. There'd be enough rennet for Aunt Polly and Grandma and Ma. So Pa went again to Uncle Henry's and came back with a piece of the little calf's stomach. It was like a piece of soft grayish-white leather, all ridged and rough on one side. When the cows were milked at night, Ma set the milk away in pans. In the morning, she skimmed off the cream to make it into butter later. Then, when the morning's milk had cooled, she mixed it with the skim milk and set it all on the stove to heat. A bit of the rennet, tied in a cloth, was soaking in warm water. When the milk was heated enough, Ma squeezed every drop of water from the rennet in the cloth, and she poured the water into the milk. She stirred it well, and left it in a warm place by the stove. In a little while, it thickened into a smooth, quivery mass. With a long knife, 
Ma cut this mass into little squares and let it stand while the curd separated from the whey. Then she poured it all into a cloth and let the thin yellowish whey drain out. When no more whey dripped from the cloth, Ma emptied the curd into a big pan and salted it, turning and mixing it well. Laura and Mary were always there, helping all they could. They loved to eat bits of the curd when Ma was salting it. It squeaked in their teeth. Under the cherry tree, outside the back door, Pa had put up the board to press the cheese on. He had cut two grooves the length of the board and laid the board on blocks, one end a little higher than the other. Under the lower end stood an empty pail. Ma put her wooden cheese hoop on the board, spread a clean, wet cloth all over the inside of it, and filled it heaping full of the chunks of salted curd. She covered this with another clean, wet cloth, and laid on top of it a round board, cut small enough to go inside the cheese hoop. Then she lifted a heavy rock on top of the board. All day long the round board settled slowly under the weight of the rock, and whey pressed out and ran down the grooves of the board into the pail. Next morning, Ma would take out the round, pale yellow cheese as large as a milk pan. Then she made more curd and filled the cheese hoop again. Every morning, she took the new cheese out of the press and trimmed it smooth. She sewed a cloth tightly around it and rubbed the cloth all over with fresh butter. Then she put the cheese on a shelf in the pantry. Every day, she wiped every cheese carefully with a wet cloth, then rubbed it all over with fresh butter once more and laid it down on its other side. After a great many days, the cheese was ripe and there was a hard rind all over it. Then Ma wrapped each cheese in paper and laid it away on the high shelf. There was nothing more to do with it but eat it. Laura and Mary liked cheese making. They liked to eat the curd that squeaked in their teeth, and they liked to eat the edges Ma pared off the big, round, yellow cheeses to make them smooth before she sewed them up in cloth. Ma laughed at them for eating green cheese. The moon is made of green cheese, some people say, she told them. The new cheese did not look like the round moon when it came up behind the trees. But it was not green. It was yellow, like the moon. It's green, Ma said, because it isn't ripened yet. When it's cured and ripened, it won't be a green cheese. Is the moon really made of green cheese? Laura asked, and Ma laughed. I think people say that because it looks like a green cheese, she said, but appearances are deceiving. Then while she wiped all the green cheeses and rubbed them with butter, she told them about the dead, cold moon that is like a little world on which nothing grows. The first day Ma made cheese, Laura tasted the whey. She tasted it without saying anything to Ma, and when Ma turned around and saw her face, Ma laughed. That night, while she was washing the supper dishes, and Mary and Laura were wiping them, Ma told Pa that Laura had tasted the whey and didn't like it. Pa was pleased. It was all so pleasant. The doors and windows wide open to the summer evening. The dishes making little cheerful sounds together as Ma washed them and Mary and Laura wiped. After a while, he said, I'm going over to Henry's tomorrow morning, Caroline, to borrow his grubbing hoe. Those sprouts are getting waist high around the stumps in the wheat field. A man just has to keep everlasting at it, or the woods will take back the place. Early next morning, he started to walk to Uncle Henry's. But before long, he came hurrying back, hitched the horses to the wagon, threw in his axe, the two wash tubs, the washer boiler, and all the pails and wooden buckets there were. 
I don't know if I'll need them all, Caroline, he said, but I'd hate to want them and not have them. Oh, what is it? What is it? Laura asked, jumping up and down with excitement. Pa's found a bee tree, Ma said. Maybe he'll bring us some honey. It was noon before Pa came driving home. Laura had been watching for him, and she ran out to the wagon as soon as it stopped by the barnyard, but she could not see into it. Pa called. Caroline, if you'll come take this pail of honey, I'll go on hitch. Ma came out to the wagon, disappointed. She said, Well, Charles, even a pail of honey is something. Then she looked in the wagon and threw up her hands. Pa laughed. All the pails and buckets were heaping full of dripping golden honeycomb. Both tubs were piled full, and so was the washer boiler. Pa and Ma went back and forth, carrying two loaded tubs and the washer boiler and all the buckets and pails into the house. Ma heaped a plate high with the golden pieces and covered all the rest neatly with cloths. For dinner, they all had as much of the delicious honey as they could eat, and Pa told them how he found the bee tree. I didn't take my gun, he said, because I wasn't hunting, and now it's summer there, wasn't much danger of meeting trouble. Panthers and bears are so fat this time of year that they're lazy and good-natured. Well, I took a shortcut through the woods, and I nearly ran into a big bear. I came around a clump of underbush, and there he was, not as far from me as across this room. He looked around at me, and I guess he saw I didn't have a gun. Anyway, he didn't pay any more attention to me. He was standing at the foot of a big tree, and bees were buzzing all around him. They couldn't sting through his thick fur, and he kept brushing them away from his head with one paw. I stood there watching him, and he put the other paw into a hole in the tree and drew it out all dripping with honey. He licked the honey off his paw and reached in for more, but by that time I had found me a club. I wanted that honey myself. So I made a great racket, banging the club against the tree and yelling. The bear was so fat and so full of honey that he just dropped on all fours and waddled off among the trees. I chased him some distance and got him going fast, away from the bee tree, and then I came back for the wagon. Laura asked him how he got the honey away from the bees. That was easy, Pa said. I left the horses back in the woods where they wouldn't get stung, and then I chopped the tree down and split it open. Didn't the bee sting you? No, said Pa. Bees never sting me. The whole tree was hollow and filled from top to bottom with honey. The bees must have been storing honey there for years. Some of it was old and dark, but I guess I got enough good clean honey to last us a long time. Laura was sorry for the poor bees. She said, they worked so hard, and now they won't have any honey. But Pa said there was lots of honey left for the bees, and there was another large hollow tree nearby into which they could move. He said it was time they had a clean new home. They would take the old honey he had left in the old tree, make it into fresh new honey, and store it in their new house. They would save every drop of the spilled honey and put it away, and they would have plenty of honey again long before winter came. Chapter 11 Harvest Pa and Uncle Henry traded work. When the grain got ripe in the fields, Uncle Henry came to work with Pa, and Aunt Polly and all the cousins came to spend the day. Then Pa went to help Uncle Henry cut his grain, and Ma took Laura and Mary and Carrie to spend the day with Aunt Polly. 
Ma and Aunt Polly worked in the house, and all the cousins played together in the yard till dinner time. Aunt Polly's yard was a fine place to play, because the stumps were so thick. The cousins played jumping from stump to stump without ever touching the ground. Even Laura, who was the littlest, could do this easily in the places where the smallest trees had grown close together. Cousin Charlie was a big boy going on eleven years old, and he could jump from stump to stump all over the yard. The smaller stumps he could jump two at a time, and he could walk on the top rail of the fence without being afraid. Pa and Uncle Henry were out in the field, cutting the oats with cradles. A cradle was a sharp steel blade fastened to a framework of wooden slats that caught and held the stalks of grain when the blade cut them. Pa and Uncle Henry carried the cradles by their long, curved handles and swung the blades into the standing oats. When they had cut enough to make a pile, they slid the cut stalks off the slats into neat heaps on the ground. It was hard work, walking around and around the field in the hot sun, and with both hands swinging the heavy cradles into the grain and cutting it, then sliding it into the piles. After all the grain was cut, they must go over the field again. This time they would stoop over each pile, and taking up a handful of stalks in each hand, they would knot them together to make a longer strand. Then gathering up the pile of grain in their arms, they would bind it tightly around with the band they had made and tie the band and tuck it in the ends. After they made seven such bundles, then the bundles must be shocked. To make a shock, they stood five bundles upright, snugly together with the oat heads up. Then over these they put two more bundles, spreading out the stalks to make a little roof and shelter the five bundles from dew and rain. Every stalk of the cut grain must always be safely in the shock before dark, for lying on the dewy ground all night would spoil it. Pa and Uncle Henry were working very hard, because the air was so heavy and hot and still they expected rain. The oats were ripe, and if they were not cut and in the shock before rain came, the crop would be lost. Then Uncle Henry's horses would be hungry all winter. At noon, Pa and Uncle Henry came to the house in a great hurry and swallowed their dinner as quickly as they could. Uncle Henry said that Charlie must help them that afternoon. Laura looked at Pa when Uncle Henry said that. At home, Pa had said to Ma that Uncle Henry and Aunt Polly spoiled Charlie. When Pa was eleven years old, he had done a good day's work every day in the fields, driving a team. But Charlie did hardly any work at all. Now Uncle Henry said that Charlie must come to the field. He could save them a great deal of time. He could go to the spring for water, and he could fetch them the water jug when they needed a drink. He could fetch the whetstone when the blades needed sharpening. All the children looked at Charlie. Charlie did not want to go to the field. He wanted to stay in the yard and play. But, of course, he did not say so. Pa and Uncle Henry did not rest at all. They ate in a hurry and went right back to work, and Charlie went with them. Now Mary was oldest and she wanted to play a quiet, ladylike play. So in the afternoon, the cousins made a playhouse in the yard. The stumps were chairs and tables and stoves, and leaves were dishes, and sticks were the children. On the way home that night, Laura and Mary heard Pa tell Ma what happened in the field. Instead of helping Pa and Uncle Henry, Charlie was making all the trouble he could. He got in their way so they couldn't swing the cradles. He hid the whetstone so they had to hunt for it when the blades needed sharpening. 
He didn't bring the water jug till Uncle Henry shouted at him three or four times, and then he was sullen. After that, he followed them around, talking and asking questions. They were working too hard to pay any attention to him, so they told him to go away and not bother them. But they dropped their cradles and ran to him across the field when they heard him scream. The woods were all around the field, and there were snakes in the oats. When they got to Charlie, there was nothing wrong. He laughed at them. He said, I fooled you that time. Pa said if he had been Uncle Henry, he would have tanned that boy's hide for him right then and there. But Uncle Henry did not do it. So they took a drink of water and went back to work. Three times Charlie screamed and they ran to him as fast as they could, and he laughed at them. He thought it was a good joke, and still Uncle Henry did not tan his hide. Then a fourth time he screamed louder than ever. Pa and Uncle Henry looked at him, and he was jumping up and down, screaming. They saw nothing wrong with him, and they had been fooled so many times that they went on with their work. Charlie kept on screaming, louder and shriller. Pa did not say anything, but Uncle Henry said, let him scream. So they went on working and let him scream. He kept on jumping up and down and screaming. He did not stop. At last, Uncle Henry said, maybe something really is wrong. They laid down their cradles and went across the field to him. And all that time, Charlie had been jumping up and down on a yellow jacket's nest. The yellow jackets lived in a nest in the ground, and Charlie stepped on it by mistake. Then all the little bees in their bright yellow jackets came swarming out with their red-hot stings, and they hurt Charlie so that he couldn't get away. He was jumping up and down, and hundreds of bees were stinging him all over. They were stinging his face and his hands and his neck and his nose. They were crawling up his pants legs and stinging and crawling down the back of his neck and stinging. The more he jumped and screamed, the harder they stung. Pa and Uncle Henry took him by the arms and ran him away from the yellow jacket's nest. They undressed him, and his clothes were full of yellow jackets, and their stings were swelling up all over him. They killed the bees that were stinging him, and they shook the bees out of his clothes, and then they dressed him again and sent him to the house. Laura and Mary and the cousins were playing quietly in the yard when they heard a loud, blubbering cry. Charlie came bawling into the yard, and his face was so swollen that the tears could hardly squeeze out of his eyes. His hands were puffed up, and his neck was puffed out, and his cheeks were big, hard puffs. His fingers stood out stiff and swollen. There were little, hard, white dents all over his puffed-out face and neck. Laura and Mary and the cousins stood and looked at him. Ma and Aunt Polly came running out of the house and asked him what was the matter. Charlie blubbered and bawled. Ma said it was yellow jackets. She ran to the garden and got a big pan of earth while Aunt Polly took Charlie into the house and undressed him. They made a big pan full of mud and plastered him all over with it. They rolled him up in an old sheet and put him to bed. His eyes were swollen shut, and his nose was a funny shape. Ma and Aunt Polly covered his whole face with mud and tied the mud on with cloths. Only the end of his nose and his mouth showed. Aunt Polly steeped some herbs to give him for his fever. Laura and Mary and the cousins stood around for some time looking at him. It was dark that night when Pa and Uncle Henry came from the field. 
all the oats were in the shock, and now the rain could come, and it would not do any harm. Pa could not stay to supper. He had to get home and do the milking. The cows were already waiting at home, and when cows are not milked on time, they do not give so much milk. He hitched up quickly, and they all got into the wagon. Pa was very tired, and his hands ached so that he could not drive very well, but the horses knew the way home. Ma sat beside him with baby Carrie, and Laura and Mary sat on the board behind them. Then they heard Pa tell about what Charlie had done. Laura and Mary were horrified. They were often naughty themselves, but they had never imagined that anyone could be as naughty as Charlie had been. He hadn't worked to help save the oats. He hadn't minded his father quickly when his father spoke to him. He had bothered Pa and Uncle Henry when they were hard at work. Then Pa told about the yellow jacket's nest, and he said, It served the little liar right. After she was in the trundle bed that night, Laura lay and listened to the rain drumming on the roof and strewing from the eaves, and she thought about what Pa had said. She thought about what the yellow jackets had done to Charlie. She thought it served Charlie right, too. It served him right because he had been so monstrously naughty, and the bees had a right to sting him when he jumped on their home. But she didn't understand why Pa had called him a little liar. She didn't understand how Charlie could be a liar when he had not said a word. Chapter 12 The Wonderful Machine Next day, Pa cut the heads from several bundles of the oats and brought the clean, bright yellow straws to Ma. She put them in a tub of water to soften them and keep them soft. Then she sat in the chair by the side of the tub and braided the straws. She took up several of them, knotted their ends together, and began to braid. The straws were different lengths, and when she came near the end of one straw, She put a new long one from the tub in its place and went on braiding. She let the end of the braid fall back into the water and kept on braiding till she had many yards of braid. All her spare time for days she was braiding straws. She made a fine, narrow, smooth braid using seven of the smallest straws. She used nine larger straws for a wider braid and made it notched all along the edges and from the very largest straws she made the widest braid of all. When all the straws were braided, she threaded a needle with strong white thread, and beginning at the end of a braid, she sewed it round and round, holding the braid so it would lie flat after it was sewed. This made a little mat, and Ma said it was the top of the crown of a hat. Then she held the braid tighter on one edge, and kept on sewing it around and around. The braid drew in and made the sides of the crown. When the crown was high enough, Ma held the braid loosely again as she kept on sewing around, and the braid lay flat and was the hat brim. When the brim was wide enough, Ma cut the braid and sewed the end fast so that it could not unbraid itself. Ma sewed hats for Mary and Laura of the finest, narrowest braid. For Pa and for herself, she made hats of the wider, notched braid. That was Pa's Sunday hat. Then she made him two everyday hats of the coarser, widest braid. When she finished a hat, Ma set it on a board to dry, shaping it nicely as she did so. And when it dried, it stayed in the shape she gave it. Ma could make beautiful hats. Laura liked to watch her, and she learned how to braid the straw and made a little hat for Charlotte. The days were growing shorter, and the nights were cooler. One night, Jack Frost passed by, and in the morning there were bright colors here and there among the green leaves of the big woods. 
Then all the leaves stopped being green. They were yellow and scarlet and crimson and golden and brown. Along the rail fence, the sumac held up its dark red cones of berries above bright flamed colored leaves. Acorns were falling from the oaks, and Laura and Mary made little acorn cups and saucers for the playhouses. Walnuts and hickory nuts were dropping to the ground in the big woods, and squirrels were scampering busily everywhere, gathering their winter store of nuts and hiding them away in hollow trees. Laura and Mary went with Ma to gather walnuts and hickory nuts and hazelnuts. They spread them in the sun to dry. Then they beat off the dried outer hulls and stored the nuts in the attic for the winter. It was fun to gather the large round walnuts and the smaller hickory nuts and the little hazelnuts that grew in bunches on the bushes. The soft outer hulls of the walnuts were full of a brown juice that stained their hands, but the hazelnut hulls smelled good and tasted good, too, when Laura used her teeth to pry a nut loose. Everyone was busy now, for all the garden vegetables must be stored away. Laura and Mary helped, picking up the dusty potatoes after Pa had dug them from the ground and pulling the long yellow carrots and the round purple top turnips and they helped Ma cook the pumpkins for pumpkin pies. With the butcher knife, Ma cut the big, orange-colored pumpkins into halves. She cleaned the seeds out of the center and cut the pumpkin into long slices from which she pared the rind. Laura helped her cut the slices into cubes. Ma put the cubes in the big iron pot on the stove, poured in some water, and then watched while the pumpkin slowly boiled down all day long. All the water and the juice must be boiled away, and the pumpkin must never burn. The pumpkin was a thick, dark, good-smelling mass in the kettle. It did not boil like water, but bubbles came up in it and suddenly exploded, leaving holes that closed quickly. Every time a bubble exploded, the rich, hot pumpkin smell came out. Laura stood on a chair and watched the pumpkin for Ma and stirred it with a wooden paddle. She held the paddle in both hands and stirred carefully, because if the pumpkin burned, there wouldn't be any pumpkin pies. For dinner, they ate the stewed pumpkin with their bread. They made it into pretty shapes on their plates. It was a beautiful color and smoothed and molded, so prettily with their knives. Ma never allowed them to play with their food at table. They must always eat nicely everything that was set before them, leaving nothing on their plates. But she did let them make the rich brown stewed pumpkin into pretty shapes before they ate it. At other times, they had baked Hubbard squash for dinner. The rind was so hard that Ma had to take Pa's axe to cut the squash into pieces. When the pieces were baked in the oven, Laura loved to spread the soft insides with butter and then scoop the yellow flesh from the rind and eat it. For supper, now, they often had hulled corn and milk. That was good, too. It was so good that Laura could hardly wait for the corn to be ready after Ma started to hull it. It took two or three days to make hulled corn. The first day, Ma cleaned and brushed all the ashes out of the cook stove. Then she burned some clean, bright hardwood and saved its ashes. She put the hardwood ashes in a little cloth bag. That night, Pa brought in some ears of corn with large plump kernels. He nubbed the ears shelling off the small, chaffy kernels at their tips. Then he shelled the rest into a large pan until the pan was full. Early next day, Ma put the shelled corn and the bag of ashes into the big iron kettle. She filled the kettle with water and kept it boiling a long time. At last, the kernels of corn began to swell, and they swelled and swelled, 
until their skins split open and began to peel off. When every skin was loose and peeling, Ma lugged the heavy kettle outdoors. She filled a clean wash tub with cold water from the spring, and she dipped the corn out of the kettle into the tub. Then she rolled the sleeves of her flowered calico dress above her elbows, and she knelt by the tub. With her hands, she rubbed and scrubbed the corn until the hulls came off and floated on top of the water. Often, she poured the water off and filled the tub again with buckets of water from the spring. She kept on rubbing and scrubbing the corn between her hands and changing the water until every hull came off and was washed away. Ma looked pretty, with her bare arms plump and white, her cheeks so red, and her dark hair smooth and shining, while she scrubbed and rubbed the corn in the clear water. She never splashed one drop of water on her pretty dress. When at last the corn was done, Ma put all the soft white kernels in a big jar in the pantry. Then at last they had hulled corn and milk for supper. Sometimes they had hulled corn for breakfast with maple syrup, and sometimes Ma fried the soft kernels in pork drippings but Laura liked them best with milk. Autumn was great fun. There was so much work to do, so many good things to eat, so many new things to see. Laura was scampering and chattering like the squirrels from morning to night. One frosty morning, a machine came up the road. Four horses were pulling it, and two men were on it. The horses hauled it up into the field where Pa and Uncle Henry and Grandpa and Mr. Peterson had stacked their wheat. Two more men drove after it another smaller machine. Pa called to Ma that the threshers had come. Then he hurried out to the field with his team. Laura and Mary asked Ma, and then they ran out to the field after him. They might watch if they were careful not to get in the way. Uncle Henry came riding up and tied his horse to a tree. Then he and Pa hitched all the other horses, eight of them, to the smaller machine. They hitched each team to the end of a long stick that came up from the center of the machine. A long iron rod lay along the ground from this machine to the big machine. Afterward, Laura and Mary asked questions and Pa told them that the big machine was called the separator, and the rod was called the tumbling rod, and the little machine was called the horsepower. Eight horses were hitched to it and made it go, so this was an eight-horsepower machine. A man sat on top of the horsepower, and when everything was ready, he clucked to the horses, and they began to go. They walked around him in a circle, each team pulling on the long stick to which it was hitched and following the team ahead. As they went around, they stepped carefully over the tumbling rod, which was tumbling over and over on the ground. Their pulling made the tumbling rod keep rolling over, and the rod moved the machinery of the separator, which stood beside the stack of wheat. All this machinery made an enormous racket, rackety banging and clanging. Laura and Mary held tight to each other's hand at the edge of the field and watched with all their eyes. They had never seen a machine before. They had never heard such a racket. Pa and Uncle Henry, on top of the wheat stack, were pitching bundles down onto a board. A man stood at the board and cut the bands on the bundles and crowded the bundles one at a time into a hole at the end of the separator. The hole looked like the separator's mouth, and it had long iron teeth. The teeth were chewing. They chewed the bundles, and the separator swallowed them. Straw blew out of the separator's other end, and wheat poured out of its side. 
two men were working fast, trampling the straw and building it into a stack. One man was working fast, sacking the pouring grain. The grains of wheat poured out of the separator into a half-bushel measure, and as fast as the measure filled, the man slipped an empty one into its place and emptied the full one into a sack. He had just time to empty it and slip it back under the spout before the other measure ran over. All the men were working as fast as they possibly could, but the machine kept right up with them. Laura and Mary were so excited they could hardly breathe. They held hands tightly and stared. The horses walked around and around. The separator swallowed the bundles. The golden straw blew out in a golden cloud. The wheat streamed golden brown out of the spout while the men hurried. Pa and Uncle Henry pitched bundles down as fast as they could and chaff and dust blew over everything. Laura and Mary watched as long as they could. Then they ran back to the house to help Ma get dinner for all those men. A big kettle of cabbage and meat was boiling on the stove. A big pan of beans and a johnny cake were baking in the oven. Laura and Mary set the table for the threshers. They put on salt-rising bread and butter, bowls of stewed pumpkin, pumpkin pies, and dried berry pies and cookies, cheese and honey, and pitchers of milk. Then Ma put on the boiled potatoes and cabbage and meat, the baked beans, the hot johnny cake, and the baked Hubbard squash, and she poured the tea. Laura always wondered why bread made of cornmeal was called johnny cake. It wasn't cake. Ma didn't know, unless the northern soldiers called it johnny cake because the people in the south, where they fought, ate so much of it. They called the southern soldiers johnny rebs. Maybe they called the southern bread cake just for fun. Ma had heard some say it should be called journey cake. She didn't know. It wouldn't be very good bread to take on a journey. At noon, the threshers came in to the table loaded with food, but there was none too much, for threshers work hard and get very hungry. By the middle of the afternoon, the machines had finished all the threshing, and the men who owned them drove them away into the big woods, taking with them the sacks of wheat that were their pay. They were going to the next place, where neighbors had stacked their wheat and wanted the machines to thresh it. Pa was very tired that night, but he was happy. He said to Ma, It would have taken Henry and Peterson and Pa and me a couple of weeks apiece to thresh as much grain with flails as the machine threshed today. We wouldn't have got as much wheat either, and it wouldn't have been as clean. That machine's a great invention, he said. Other folks can stick to old-fashioned ways if they want to, but I'm all for progress. It's a great age we're living in. As long as I raise wheat, I'm going to have a machine come and thresh it, if there's one anywhere in the neighborhood. He was too tired that night to talk to Laura, but Laura was proud of him. It was Pa who had got the other men to stack their wheat together and send for the threshing machine, and it was a wonderful machine. Everyone was glad it had come. Chapter 13 The Deer in the Wood The grass was dry and withered, and the cows must be taken out of the woods and kept in the barn to be fed. All the bright-colored leaves became dull brown when the cold fall rains began. There was no more playing under the trees. But Pa was in the house when it rained, and he began again to play the fiddle after supper. Then the rains stopped. The weather grew colder. In the early mornings, everything sparkled with frost. The days were growing short and a little fire burned all day in the cook stove to keep the house warm. 
winter was not far away. The attic and the cellar were full of good things once more, and Laura and Mary had started to make patchwork quilts. Everything was beginning to be snug and cozy again. One night, when he came in from doing the chores, Pa said that after supper he would go to his deer leg and watch for a deer. There had been no fresh meat in the little house since spring, but now the fawns were grown up and Pa would go hunting again. Pa had made a deer leg in an open place in the woods, with trees nearby in which he could sit to watch it. A deer lick was a place where the deer came to get salt. When they found a salty place in the ground, they came there to lick it, and that was called a deer lick. Pa had made one by sprinkling salt over the ground. After supper, Pa took his gun and went into the woods, and Laura and Mary went to sleep without any stories or music. As soon as they woke in the morning, they ran to the window, but there was no deer hanging in the trees. Pa had never before gone out to get a deer and come home without one. Laura and Mary did not know what to think. All day, Pa was busy, banking the little house and the barn with dead leaves and straw held down by stones to keep out the cold. The weather grew colder all day, and that night, there was once more a fire on the hearth, and the windows were shut tight and chinked for the winter. After supper, Pa took Laura on his knee, while Mary sat close in her little chair, and Pa said, Now I'll tell you why you had no fresh meat to eat today. When I went out to the deer leg, I climbed up into a big oak tree. I found a place on a branch where I was comfortable and could watch the deer lick. I was near enough to shoot any animal that came to it, and my gun was loaded and ready on my knee. There I sat and waited for the moon to rise and light the clearing. I was a little tired from chopping wood all day yesterday, and I must have fallen asleep, for I found myself opening my eyes. The big round moon was just rising. I could see it between the bare branches of the trees, low in the sky. And right against it, I saw a deer standing. His head was up and he was listening. His great branching horns stood out above his head. He was dark against the moon. It was a perfect shot, but he was so beautiful. He looked so strong and free and wild that I couldn't kill him. I sat there and looked at him until he bounded away into the dark woods. Then I remembered that Ma and my little girls were waiting for me to bring home some good fresh venison. I made up my mind that next time I would shoot. After a while, a big bear came lumbering out into the open. He was so fat from feasting on berries and roots and grubs all summer that he was nearly as large as two bears. His head swayed from side to side as he went on all fours across the clear space in the moonlight until he came to a rotten log. He smelled it and listened. Then he pawed it apart and sniffed among the broken pieces, eating up the fat white grubs. Then he stood up on his hind legs, perfectly still, looking all around him. He seemed to be suspicious that something was wrong. He was trying to see or smell what it was. He was a perfect mark to shoot at, but I was so interested in watching him, and the woods were so peaceful in the moonlight that I forgot all about my gun. I did not even think of shooting him until he was waddling away into the woods. This will never do, I thought. I'll never get any meat this way. I settled myself in the tree and waited again. This time I determined to shoot the next game I saw. The moon had risen higher, and the moonlight was bright in the little open place. All around it the shadows were dark among the trees. 
After a long while, a doe and her yearling fawn came stepping daintily out of the shadows. They were not afraid at all. They walked over to the place where I had sprinkled the salt, and they both licked up a little of it. Then they raised their heads and looked at each other. The fawn stepped over and stood beside the doe. They stood there together, looking at the woods and the moonlight. Their large eyes were shining and soft. I just sat there, looking at them, until they walked away among the shadows. Then I climbed down out of the tree and came home. Laura whispered in his ear, I'm glad you didn't shoot them. Mary said, We can eat bread and butter. Pa lifted Mary up out of her chair and hugged them both together. You're my good girls, he said, and now it's bedtime. Run along while I get my fiddle. When Laura and Mary had said their prayers and were tucked snugly under the trundle bed's covers, Pa was sitting in the firelight with the fiddle. Ma had blown out the lamp because she did not need its light. On the other side of the hearth, she was swaying gently in her rocking chair, and her knitting needles flashed in and out above the sock she was knitting. The long winter evenings of firelight and music had come again. Pa's fiddle wailed, while Pa was singing. When the fiddle had stopped singing, Pa said, Go to sleep now. But Laura lay awake a little while, listening to Pa's fiddle softly playing and to the lonely sound of the wind in the big woods. She looked at Pa sitting on the bench by the hearth, the firelight gleaming on his brown hair and beard and glistening on the honey-brown fiddle. She looked at Ma, gently rocking and knitting, and she thought to herself, This is now. She was glad that the cozy house and Pa and Ma and the firelight and the music were now. They could not be forgotten, she thought, because now is now. It could never be a long time ago. Sweet dreams, my friend. Sleep well.